Good afternoon, everyone. I am Diego de Oshossi. I'm a Kimbanda priest and a Orisha priest in Brazil. And well, I first got into Kimbanda uh, from a familiar ancestry. Actually, I had a long history from uh, a, a long childhood history in Kimbanda, in Umbanda, sorry, uh, from a lot, uh, a few years. And when I, when I was uh, just when I was born, I had a uh, uncurable disease, and my grandmother took me to a healer, to a Kimbanda healer, that created some kind of uh, ritual with the spirits. And uh, even though the, the doctor said I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't leave after seven years old, he did a lot of rituals and a kind of a pact, a health pact for me. And the price, let's say, let's call it the price would be to get this tradition in my life to be initiated and to serve this tradition in my life. And that's what happened 20 something years after. So I didn't die at seven, uh, seven years as the doctor said I would. And at 22, 24 years old, I was initiated and became a priest of Kimbanda to take this tradition uh, along for other people. I guess that's the, the best way to say. In the middle of this, I was, uh, when, when I was initiated, actually my initiator was uh, celebrating 50 years of her initiation. And the idea was to, uh, to put down this history, to, read, to, to register, to register this, this history and to tell how she, became, how she became the historical founder, the historical uh, creator of Kimbanda as, a, as an, organized, an organized religion in Brazil. And that's what the book is all about. So traditional Brazilian black magic is all about telling, uh, telling the story of a poor, uh, uneducated black woman that is considered to be the founder of this traditional Brazilian religion, this traditional Brazilian cult of black magic and the spirits cult. Uh, well, so that's, I think that's it. Nick, uh, your turn. My who's turn. Nikolai Frisvold, who's Nikolai Frisvold, uh, who, who is Nikolai Frisvold <laughs> that I knew so, that I heard so much about after, uh, before becoming, becoming a, a priest and now that I have the, the honor to be a friend of. Yes, no, thank you, Diego. It's, uh, thank you for inviting uh, me to, uh, to speak uh, about Kimbanda. To get with you today, really. Uh, my interest in Kimbanda is a bit less uh, uh, less roots and healing oriented. Uh, it was uh, uh, more curiosity, but also a sense of calling, really, because for um, a guy in Norway to have access to something useful to read about Kimbanda in a language not Portuguese was kind of difficult uh, some uh, 25 years ago. But I, uh, I managed. It was this, uh, I remember Technical Sacred, they uh, made a, a translation of uh, Antonio de Alba's book about Pombagira. So very slim volume. Uh, and I was immediately fascinated with all this uh, diabolic uh, iconography and uh, all this, but uh, I placed that aside. And then I had friends going to Brazil that st started to, ah, I saw this image of Pombagira, Motorono the Inferno. I saw this Pombagira, you know, the queen of the seven crosses. I bought her for you. So all of a sudden, people started sending me images of Pombagira. <laughs> uh, and of course, I, I, I admit I had a deep fascination, but uh, I think it was more kind of uh, uh, what's going on down there in Brazil, where the, you know the, they just embrace this uh, diabolic iconography and uh, all that. So it so happened uh, that it was possible for me to go to Brazil to university to make um, a field study about Kimbanda. Uh, I had two contacts in Brazil. Uh, that they would facilitate uh, contact with Kimbandeus and so on. 
and uh, I had luck. I came to Sao Paulo. I was well received, and uh, this was the start of uh, me uh, staying in uh, Brazil. And this is 20 years ago. <laughs> so, if you see this kind of uh, how all this happened in the space of a couple of years, I, I have to confess that I felt a little bit of a, a calling, right, from Eshu and Pomagira that say, uh, well, somehow this uh, Norseman. Uh, will do something good uh, in the name of the spirits. Hence, these books that I wrote about the Shuman Pomagera was really driven by uh, my love for Kimbanda to, to, to show that this, this devil and his demoness, uh, there are so much more. It's incredible depths to Kimbanda. Is uh, you start working uh, with these spirits, uh, getting intimate with the uh, spirits, take them on as guys in your life, it's, Uh, it's amazing how your life, your perception, how everything changes and shifts in, in such a good way. Well, of course, with ordeals, but it's, uh, it's also that uh, uh, with these spirits uh, helping you, guiding you, assisting you, as uh, taking part of your life, is uh, uh, these ordeals, the, the troubles of uh, life, you, you, you tend to approach with more interest, more than... Uh, Oh, it's a problem what now it's kind of I made some uh, offerings or works with this and the spirit is not working my life is uh, not going the right direction in what issue and like teaches us and guides us you know in understanding life in the totality so for me it's uh, different than Diego it was uh, really this uh, uh, is this a calling then academia opened a way for me to travel and uh, I traveled and I stayed <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you did you find any <clears throat> when you before initiated and uh, when you start writing writing about Eshu and Pombajira and Kimban and uh, all of your books, did you found any challenges to explain Kimbanda and to explain Eshu and Pombajira to foreign readers? I ask you this because, uh, as I said, I I grew up in Umbanda uh, since I was two years old, and well. Teenage years came, I partied all, all I could and I didn't want to know anything about religion. But when I grew up, I needed to, to get this, this mission back, to, to, have, to get this calling back. And when I started in Kimbanda and started to write, it, uh, to write about it, actually almost at the same time I, I was being initiated, uh, it was very organic to me. I don't, I don't know exactly if this is for being a, a Brazilian born and we have this, uh, this uh, intimacy with spirits code in Brazil since, since we are born here. But uh, writing about Kimbanda and writing about uh, Manieda and the show in Pombajira was something very natural to me. So in the, in the Portuguese edition, I, I think that uh, some things were missing in the Portuguese edition. And I just realized that when Inner Tradition started to edit in the, the, the English edition for the, for the book, because they said, Diego, the book is amazing. You tell the whole story from uh, slavery until nowadays, but you are talking with some, uh, some, you're talking with readers that don't know what is a, to embody a spirit, for example. They don't know what is a shoe. They don't have any idea. So you actually need to first introduce them To the, to, to, the, to the theme of the book, to, the, to the, the, the thematic of the book, and then we can uh, get the translation on. So from the, from the, the Portuguese edition of Unveglen uh, Eshu, which is the, the Portuguese title of the book, to traditional Brazilian black, black magic, I needed to, to, to write a first chapter for English edition explaining what is Eshu and Pombajira and how we deal and how we expect to, to enjoy the, the embodiment, the spiritual embodiment. Did you find any, any uh, challenges or difficulties to, to write for foreign, uh, foreign readers, talking about this very organic things that are for us in Brazil? No, I, I don't think so. It's, uh, it's a bit kind of uh, the, the challenge in my academic life anyway, if it's anthropology or psychology, it's this kind of making sense of a phenomena for the other, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, 
But what I discovered is that, uh, so when you speak about um, mediumship and uh, possession and uh, all this, uh, less now, but in the beginning, it's, uh, it just uh, evoked a lot of fear. It's because everyone was kind of automatically going towards, uh, but isn't that like the exorcist? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm, not really, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the, uh, what was difficult 20 years ago in terms of the West is, uh, is the thing that uh, the possession had this very negative connotation from horror movies, that possession was always from a bad spirit that refused to live, that uh, would uh, ultimately... Uh, run your life down in the gutter and kill you. So, uh, but I, I think it's a shift in uh, perception about me. So this now, more curiosity about how it works, you know? How is uh, the, uh, and, and for me as well, I have to say in the, in the beginning, it was a bit scary for me as well, uh, training mediumship and uh -huh. okay, okay, I'm healing and what, what now, what now? And, no, 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 I can't <laughs> enter. And yeah, you know how it is, uh, all this. Uh, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> <laughs> things that happen when spirit wants and you don't want and oh. so uh, uh, of course it's, it's very different uh, this part of uh, explaining how it is and uh, being there sensing and experiencing uh, the, the same process so but uh, uh, but I'm seeing that in uh, like in the, in the next book uh, that uh, on Kimbana that is out on Hedi next year, I mm -hmm. uh, Kim, Kimbana theory and practice that is out next year. Uh, I do have a chapter about uh, possession and mediumship and uh, thinking better. It's a, it's a lot about uh, you know how to interact with spirit, spirit and so on in uh, various camps. So I didn't thought about this, uh, Diego, but uh, I think yeah, <laughs> uh, deep under there, it has been a kind of uh, wish to communicate exactly a lot about this. You know how to mm -hmm. uh, communicate, how to establish connection, how to feel uh, when it's real and not, and it's kind of I'm thinking now is wow, well, it's in many places. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this, this is something that I got from uh, a feedback from, from the editors that, uh, well, if when we talk but in a tradition, first, uh, first published the book uh, in the US, and it, exactly what you said, they said to me, Diego, people are used to think about possession as a demonic <laughs> thing, as a, a poltergeist a movie yes. that you're going to flip <laughs> your head over and over. How, uh, and, and they said to me, you need to explain to them that in Kimbanda, it is... The, the, it's expected to happen, this possession, and that's not a, a, an evil thing. That's not a bad yeah. thing, actually. We, we enjoy and we share our faith with the spirits when, we are, when they are embodied. And I guess yeah. that's one of the things that uh, amazes me the most in, in, in Kimbanda or in Candomblé or in other African-American African traditions we have, that the Christian God is always aside, is always distant. You need to pray and you need to, uh, sometimes you need actually to, uh, how's the word in English, sorry, to, to beg for him to, to, to listen to you. You need to, to pray and, and beg and starve and suffer to be, uh, to, to maybe have the right to be heard and, and blessed for your, for your God. And this is a very usual uh, Christian way of life. You pray and, and you beg and you pray and you beg and you pray and you beg and then you suffer a lot and then you pray and you beg again and maybe you'll be blessed. And that's a different, uh, a different relationship we create with the spirits. This is something that amazes me the most in Kimbanda that we basically create this bond, this lifetime bond with our unbreakable best friend. And we, we actually talk a little bit uh, about it in your uh, in past month in your house about the, this friendship and this uh, dynamic, this, relation, this relationship dynamics that we create with the spirits once we are initiated. How was it for you to, to start this relationship? I, I'm asking you this because uh, once again, I said, I said, uh, for being a Brazilian and uh, and born in, been born and grew and growing up in a Umbanda family, 
possession was something very natural to me. You know, uh, I, I, I remember being a child and seeing my mother, my mother, my grandmother, sorry, seeing my grandmother and my godmother uh, possessed by caboclos, possessed by ancient blacks, possessed by children's spirits. And it was very common to me. So mm. the first time I saw an issue embodied or a Pombajir embodied, embodied, of course, the, there is that uh, personality, maybe that archetype of a rascal, of a marginal li uh, living, uh, living being that the issue in Pombajir brought, uh, brings. So they uh, speak a lot of bad words and laugh, laugh a lot. And that's not something we used to see in Umbanda. But even though being a child, uh, it was weird to me to see that all that freedom being, being uh, played by the spirits in a Kimbanda session. Uh, it wasn't weird to me that I was seeing my, my grandmother's body, but I was speaking with someone who wasn't her, you know? Uh, how, how was it for you to, to the, the first con contact with uh, spirits manifestations? Okay, my uh, my kind of interaction with the uh, with living cults or spirit cults uh, where we have possession, it didn't start with uh, Kimbanda. I started with uh, in Cuba with uh, Paula Mayomba and uh, Lukumi and Ifa Orisha cult uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in Cuba. So I had some familiarity with this and. Uh, uh, I guess this Cuban experience, I, I guess I went there five times, I guess, in total to, to complete all these kind of things and stayed uh, quite some time, uh, all of these visits. So uh, I, I was not afraid or scared uh, with Kimbanda. It's kind of, uh, it, it, I have been in this uh, vicinity before of spirits, but what, uh, was very different for, for me was the directness of uh, the spirits. Uh, with kind of uh, muertos in the, the Mesa Spiritual in Cuba or in the Orishas or even with the Nikisis. So all this is uh, it's a different relationship with the issue and the Pombajira. It was this uh, you there. Yeah, you motherfucker, I'm uh -huh. speaking to you. Uh, that was really blew my mind the first times. The, my, my first uh, console, so my, the, the, my first meetings with the shoot to my, uh, my godfather it was still one of the most impressive meetings I had with spirit in my entire life. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I think in the beginning it was a, a mix of uh, wow, this is amazing, and shit, he sees right through me. Damn. <laughs> so uh, for me, it started uh, started out very much with respect, mm -hmm. uh, but it took a very short time because of the jokes, the bad words, and you know all this uh, shagong. I think. Uh, uh, it also helps to, to make a very uh, amicable uh, ambience, you know, a friendly ambience. So uh, this spirit friendly connection, uh, it was established uh, very, uh, very fast. It's just that, uh, especially with my issue, I think I, I admired him so much for many years. Was he so wise and so uh, understanding and uh, what uh, over time is kind of, yeah. It's really uh, this my, my best friend uh, uh, connection, and uh, this I'm looking after him, and he's looking after me. Mm -hmm. If I'm unaware of something, he always sends a omen, a message, something that is kind of a sign that uh, you, is unmistakable, and uh, it's. Uh, it's kind of amazing, uh, Jago. It's having, uh, <laughs> having this kind this, of strong uh, this, love. Yeah, this connection yeah. and this this uh, presence, twenty four hours a day. Now, uh, you know, you you mentioned something that's very, very interesting, and uh, 
it's what made me devote my life to Kimbanda, is this mm. new connection. And uh, once again, uh, I started in Umbanda, but Umbanda always seemed weird to me when mediums in, Kimba in, in Umbanda most of the time struggle with uh, or poverty or difficulties in life or any kinds of uh, challenges. And uh, I, I looked around and I, say, and I asked myself, where are their spirits? You know, mm. they serve, they serve, they serve, they serve, they uh, give up their Friday nights, they give up a lot of hours of their, their time, they, uh, but, and they are serving the others, but they are lacking a lot of things in their lives. And when I, when I first got contact with Kimbanda, with this traditional Kimbanda, that was something that got me. Oh, you can you can serve the others. Okay, that's good for you. You can do charity. You can uh, open a, a jira, a, a session to a free a, a session for free councils with the spirits or something like this. But before all this to happen, you need to be you, you need you need to take care of yourself, and the shoe will take care of yourself. So I used to say that Kimbanda is a very selfish religion. It's a very selfish cult. <laughs> In the best, in, uh, in the best sense of the word, because how can I give something for someone? How can I give a good counsel? How can I create a, a ritual for prosperity or for healing someone or to bring love for uh, for someone's life? If I don't have prosperity in my life, if I'm not a health person, if I don't have, uh, fine, if I didn't uh, leave the love one, uh, at least once in my life, you know, and yeah. that's what I. What catches me the most in Kimbanda? You 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 gotta look to yourself. A shoe, your shoe will serve, will will it's like a, a not a contract actually, but a, as as we said, a friendship. I will look for you while you look for me. And that mm -hmm. this relationship is getting stronger and stronger and stronger with uh, with the years in, in cult and the practices and the, the rituals we, we pass through. But at the same time, they are uh, the spirits become our best friends, and they really take care of us, even though, even when we're not expecting to, and even when we're not understanding the 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 path they 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 are putting in our lives and uh, and the the things that are happening, but they also act as a mm, mentor. Maybe I was going to say father, but not quite that word. I get. I guess they act, yeah. uh, they act like a mentor and they... Yeah, it's, uh, it's over word guide. guide yeah, exactly. They, they really guide yes. our lives. But there is a huge difference. And I see this a lot in, in Eshu and Pombajira and not other, other sorts of spirits that they advise, but not mm -hmm. necessarily they guide. They treat uh, yeah. us... <laughs> You know, they said, they said, uh, well, that's the way I would do. That's the, the road I will take. That's the mm -hmm. decision that I will make. But you're free to do what you want. Yes. Oh, but wasn't you my best friend? Wasn't you the, the magical protective being that was supposed to give me 24 hours uh, uh, free of, uh, of challenges and dangers? And this is something amazing. No, he's not going to take you out of uh, every dangers in the world, unless you hear the advices, unless you uh, give yourself for, for a shoe wisdom. That's not a, most of the time, it's not a peaceful and uh, charmful <laughs> uh, char uh, character. What, uh, what do you think about this connection with the spirits that more than, or not more, but that at the same time that guide and protect, they challenge us against life. You know, I think so. Uh, issue is uh, most of them are uh, the souls of uh, dead people, you know, people that most live it, that uh, are coming back in the form of issue to, to guide and interact with the living. And if you see the histories of the issues, they uh, most of them always uh, 
uh, died uh, because of bad choices or bad situations or whatever. So uh, when they say they want to work with us, they want to create this uh, uh, VR zone uh, with us, uh, is to experience the fullness of life. Because mm -hmm. it should know that uh, death is not the end and there are many things worse in life than death and, you know, problems can be uh, fun and it's, uh, uh, there's some, some kind of level of adventure with the shoe as well. They want to live life to the fullest. And having this uh, plain, uneventful life, I think for them, this is not life. This is not living. You know, you need to have a little bit of, uh, uh, hoo what is this? A little bit of... Uh, uh, elements of life that upsets you, that makes you think, that makes you grow, that makes you mature. So uh, I think this is one part. And I also think that uh, with this having issue as your friend, that uh, you know, in traditional astrology, we have this idea that uh, Mercury, the planet Mercury, is a neutral planet, but uh, we mm -hmm. say that uh, Mercury is good with good and bad with bad. And I think issue is very much the same. So if, uh, if you're a person that is kind of, uh, you're focusing on uh, using this relationship uh, for, uh, for good ends, you know? Okay, fine, it's selfish. But uh, how I see is kind of, if your life gets better, my life gets better too. Because if you're in a good state of mind and things are going good for you, you, uh, uh, you will not, uh, do negative things and wicked things and start uh, creating uh, on peace around you because you are frustrated in life and all this. Huh? So I think a shoe can help us with uh, with this part, right? Uh, because as we see, yeah, it's uh, these commandos that are drawn to a shoe because of the power and all this selfishness and this kind of yeah, now I am the uh, the king of the world and I can mm -hmm. burn everyone with uh, fire and brimstone and you know it's my will and my desire all over and it's kind of bent. Okay, it might work for a little bit of time, but uh, these people ultimately always end up alienated, alone, sick and unhealthy. Uh, you know, it's not the way to go. Again, what you said, so as she will say, you know, it's kind of, I would take this way. Mm -hmm. What you do is up to you. Because I think issue allows, you know, it's kind of, it's an immoral quality to issue that don't interfere with, the, with our choices. It's just a kind of, okay, so take that road and see where it ends. So, but I think uh, that if you're, sorry, sorry. If you're humble, in, uh, if people are humble in uh, this uh, way and they see that it's kind of shit, I made the wrong choice. Uh-huh. And they kind of reach out to issue instead of growing their arrogance uh -huh, uh -huh. i think issue is there to kind of okay you see my friend better choices next time <laughs> <laughs> but uh then then I, I, I catch myself thinking we basically when we look for a, a religion we look for some kind of salvation in a way or another we look for a, a deity that can bless us in this life or in the next one that can guarantee us a place in heaven <laughs> or something like this. But we, uh, usually we never stop to worship a, an energy or a deity that will challenge us. We expect for miracles, actually. The, the, the majority of, of people look for religion expecting for miracles expecting for things to happen magically and miraculously in their lives because god says that should be uh, in your opinion what's the point of worshiping this so tricky energy and having this tricky energy as the major guide of your life because or in uh, other words uh what can a uh, what would a Kimbanda interest find and uh, what's the point of following the Kimbanda path? I think it fits very well in uh, into my own uh, life philosophy, really, issue and uh, Pomaji, because well, I think uh, miracles belong to God. You know, it's a uh, issue deals with magic. Mm -hmm. 
magic is about uh, manipulating uh, energies and the world uh, so uh, certain uh, objectives uh, can be uh, can be found and held and accomplished so uh, for me is this thing as well with the afterlife and uh, all this and reward and oh, be a good boy and then you have your reward in heaven i was never very much sold on this you know so uh, for me, it's uh, more about uh, the, the life that we have now and uh, how to make sense of life itself. And in this sense, the shoe is the best uh, <laughs> mentor, best guy that we can have. And, uh, but do you think that any kind of issue worshiping is Kimbanda? Uh, what, what makes Kimbanda Kimbanda, what makes a, 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 legit, a legitimate, le, legitimate Kimbanda or a legitimate Kimbandero? Because uh, I, I used to say that, uh, of course, before <clears throat> before uh, 1950s, when Mother Yeda founded the, the traditional Kimbanda, as I, as I call in the book, and right uh, much before uh, 1940s when uh, Kimbana in Rio de Janeiro was uh, started to take form, it should already existed. And we have some, some, uh, some notices, some, some registers, some records of uh, Kimbana, of Eshu practices in Rio's Macumba in mid Asia in the 18th century, 19th century. But that wasn't actually a religion, that wasn't actually in, in organized cults. So I don't I don't think we can say that the issue practices found in the 19th century and in the beginning of the 20th century can be called Kimbanda. You know, it's uh, I guess Kimbanda is another thing. It gets it gets to be organized. You get to be initiated in these mysteries to be able to access this issue wisdom and uh, and life transformation that issue can give us. But in your opinion, what do you think makes a legit, uh, legitimate Kimbandeiro? It's just to summon a shoe? Okay, this, uh, this was my uh, part of my ongoing research in Kimbanda and Umbanda and all this uh, for many, many years. Authentic, true Kimbanda, where it started, uh, who is the source of all this and uh, all that. And well, my conclusion is that the uh, Kimbanda is, is the cult of Eshu and Pomajiri. So, uh, where these two forces are cultivated in a good and honest way, we have Kimbanda. And I think it was uh, always like this. It's, if you see the history of uh, Brazilian magic and spirituality, Eshu and Pomajiri, they managed to kind of seep in everywhere mm -hmm. to, to kind of take their place. So, uh, you see, in, uh, well, in, uh, in, in my tradition, uh, Kimbanda was uh, guarded as a secret cult in the basement that you know it was secret, kept away from everyone as a kind of uh, uh, almost a secret weapon that you could have if you made your candomblé, your umbanda, something like this. Uh, so, in the end, I think really, uh, Diego, I think it's, uh, it's about uh, the, the true connection with your gear is what makes a Kimbandeo. It's kind of, uh, so as long as people are honest with what is happening here, that the connection is true, you know where you're coming from, well, that's a Kimbandeo. Mm -hmm. So, no initiation required? In, yes. Ah, that's, that, that, that's what I was, I was trying to get to. Ah, okay. We, we okay. hear a lot of the people, uh, even in, in Brazil, we hear a lot of people saying, oh, I'm, uh, I'm a Kimbandist, I'm a Kimbandeiro, I, I, uh, I embody Yeshu, I, 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 Yeshu possesses me, and then I'm doing Kimbanda. And I get myself thinking, are you, is it really doing Kimbanda or are you just embodying oh. spirit? No, it's what I, it's, uh, this we know, it's, uh, so if you, if you open a Jira Umbanda and uh, working in Umbanda, you can come down and work in Umbanda. 
right? Mm -hmm. so you can mm -hmm. the medium can be a medium for a issue, but is uh, is on the terms of Umbanda, not Kimbanda. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So with Kimbanda, yeah, I think uh, the initiation is is important. You know, you is uh, there are some steps that need to be in uh, place in terms of uh, uh, the. Should we say the tradition itself to to be established and continued. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you think issue out uh, with no initiation and me mediums with no initiation or issues outside King Banda regular cults? And uh, uh, when I say regular cults, I would say initiate uh, initiation uh, cults, even though we're talking about reveals or Porto Alegre's tradition. Uh, do you think these spirits with where when the medium is not have no initiation and no pact with the spirit because what i understand that the initiation is what create the bond with, between us and the spirit and until you get the initiation you can have any spirit appearing in your, in your summonings and they don't have a commitment with, with you at the same time you don't have any commitment with them once you get initiated, you create this bond. And in my opinion, this makes a huge difference. Not just to say, oh, I am traditional, I got initiated by there in, in, in this or that or that tradition, but I actually I have this bond, I have this commitment, and not just a worship in practices, but uh, the worship, the, the, the rituals, the offerings, and the worshiping is actually a way of uh, strengthen this bond created in the, in the initiation. And at, uh, before that, do you think that this non-initiated have some kind of magical or ritual limitations? Oh, of course, because they, they will not have support from lineage, which but I think is important. Spirit? So in what sense? Ah, the, uh, if the uh, spirit is uh, responding in the same way to a yeah, you know, yeah, made yeah. Kimbandeiro versus yeah, a self-made yeah. Kimbandeiro. Exactly. I think that's a very complicated uh, question because uh, I think if, uh, if you have access to do things right, you should do things right. Uh, if there is no access for you, but... Uh, you want to do things right, spirit will find a way. Is this kind of question? Of, so everything has to start somewhere, right? It's kind of no cult, uh, it's uh, started fully formed. It started with uh, one or more persons uh, having a epiphany, a vision, a spirit contact. And from this, okay, let's establish the cult. So of course this can happen uh, nowadays as well. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a very complicated uh, discussion uh, to have because if you say, yeah, it's possible, <laughs> people, some people can say, yeah, but uh, the, these okay, guys so, told so that I'm it's possible. So <laughs> it's kind of, so I can be lazy and not do, and I do things the best as I can. And I uh, put some pieces together here and there from this and that and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it's, uh, I'm making Kimban. It's not really like this. As, uh, as I told, it, I think it's very important to, to show some dedication to spirit as well, to, to go after this, you know, uh, in a sincere and, uh, and truthful way. And then spirit will open the, the, the gates for you. So, uh, yeah, this, you'll read this question, what is, the, what is genuine, authentic in Bandit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a complicated question. Oh. Complicated answers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I I really believe that can can be uh, can exist Kimbanda outside Brazil, but I understand that this uh, foreign Kimbanda must have a Brazilian lineage, and mm. I say this because. Any tradition, and, and I'm, when I say any tradition, Nick, told, Nick used the word that's very important here. He says, in, in my Kimbanda, in my tradition, uh, I think and I do like this. 
And that's something that's very special between, between us both because Nick is initiated in a very in a very distant tradition from mine, geographically speaking. Nick was initiated in uh, Southeast Brazil. I was initiated in Southern Brazil. It's very uh, different ways of, of Kimbanda in, in the rituals. They, they're much different, the way they're done. But when we met and we started to, to know each other and to know our, uh, our codes, we understood that even though what's seen in the rituals, the, 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 the way of doing the things, they are different and they are different because they were initiated by, they were originated from, from different people and in different geographical re, uh, regions of Brazil. They both have the same basis. So I do the souls feast and the soul summoning different from Nick, but I do the soul feast and he does too. I do the realms feast and the realm summoning in an, in, in an initiation rite, and he does different, but he does others, he, he does too. And I guess that's what amazed us and actually brought us together that we are very similar, even though the, the rites are very different. But one thing that is common is that first, first, first of all, we are worshiping Brazilian spirits. And that's a uh, starting point to say that I understand and I accept there are foreign Kimbanders, but they must have a Brazilian lineage because all things started in Brazil. Even though we have some African uh, influences in Kimbanda, Kimbanda is not an African cult. The Kimbanda we're, we're talking here, the Kimbanda we're talking about summoning the spirits and pacting with the spirits and uh, working and worshiping and embodying and uh, being possessed by Yeshu and Pombajira, that, that was, uh, the, uh, it doesn't exist in Africa. So we are talking about a cult that was basically created and organized in Brazil. But if uh, a Brazilian, a, a Kimbanda, a Brazilian Kimbandeiro, goes live abroad and opens uh, and start a temple, or if a foreigner comes to Brazil, get initiated and goes back home and started a temple, yeah, there is Kimbanda outside Brazil. And then when he starts to initiate foreigners, I understand that these spirits in the new temple won't be Brazilian. They can be, but they, but they don't need to be because we're talking about an ancestry bond. I understand that the, the initiated, my issue is only my issue because he's my ancestral. There are a lot of spirits in Kimbanda. There are a lot of spirits with the same name in Kimbanda, but these specific spirits that, uh, that I was initiated to and that created this lifelong bond of being my mentor, being my guide and taking care of me while I take care of him, he's only my specific guide, my personal guide, because he's a, an ancestor of mine. So when we initiate a foreigner, a, a North American or a, a, a English, an English or a Spanish, or we're we're going to initiate him for his uh, his or her ancestry. And I think it's it would be very acceptable to to this uh, this spirit to not speak Portuguese, to not know uh, Brazilian magic, this this mix of. Uh, indigenous, black, and the spirit cult we are used to have in Brazil, but it got to start, to start from, from somewhere, and this somewhere must be Brazil. What's your opinion, Nick? No, what I'm, uh, what I'm saying, because uh, the day initiated people uh, that is living abroad and is uh, working uh -huh. abroad, and uh, what I see is that uh, uh, the fundamental the, the foundation of uh, these temples. So let's say, uh, so the issue and the Pomagira that is uh, ruling the temple, they will attract uh, similar type of spirits in the new geographic location. Uh, they will still attract uh, malandros, you know, scoundrels, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they take a different shape. They will attract spirits from the Crusader, from uh, the, all the kingdoms, but they have a different shape because they are in a different country. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think it's uh, uh, very, very interesting to see the, uh, the spirit references 
that uh, comes to take place that is gravitated towards the, the fundamental in the temple established abroad. Uh, because they, they work in similar ways, you know? It's just that it's a, a lot of pioneering work uh, that has to take place uh, before it's kind of a, uh, becomes a very vibrant living Kimbanda. You know, so you have to put put in the work and uh, you know being tight uh, with your gears and uh, all this for uh, for things to, to kind of uh, establish itself in a good way. I don't know if I would call it a Brazilian way, but more than that, a Latin way. You know, this Latino uh, hot. Uh, this Latino heat, this Latino that uh, cries for, for a lot of things, but also dance and laughs and uh, speak louder for a lot of things. I guess that that's a, a characteristic of all Latinos and Brazilian also. But yeah, I guess there is the, the archetype. But as, as Nick was saying, when we have a, a temple abroad with spirits from abroad, I really don't know if we could expect this archetype from English issues, for example. Do, do you think we could expect a very party up, cheer up, Latino heat uh, archetype from uh, other spirits, Nick? No, what I, what I see from people that is uh, working in uh, Europe, especially North Europe and Central Europe, is that uh, uh, these spiritual references to uh, uh, various types of spirits we have in Kimbanda, they uh, take on a more uh, somber mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. pers persona. So it's uh, it's still fire, but it's uh, it's more tempered, more uh, more in tune with the atmosphere of the of the country, really. But. Uh, uh, even like this, if uh, let's take Norway. Uh, I didn't work at the Kimbanda in Norway because, well, I emigrated and stayed here since mm -hmm. 20 years ago. So, but uh, I would think if I now would go back to Norway and uh, start uh, uh, working with my, my spirits there, uh, they would attract, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Roma people, you know, the Ciganos. In, uh, mm -hmm. that is uh, very drawn here to, to Kimbanda. We, we have scoundrels there, you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, I think they, they would uh, establish uh, some sort of, uh, uh, spiritual network based upon the, the spirits accessible in, uh, in this country, because uh, dead ones are everywhere and spirits of the crossroad are everywhere. So, uh, but uh, again, it's kind of, it's, uh, I think it's a big pioneering work that you have to invest in to, to make these uh, forces assemble naturally, to gravitate around uh, the foundation that you planted in your temple in that foreign location. So uh, I do believe that uh, uh, this uh, whole tempered Latino thing would enter because uh, people you know, of this disposition would naturally gravitate towards this when they are disincarnated uh -huh, uh -huh. and uh, and all this. So, uh, well, I'm just guessing, but I, I think uh, this would make sense. <laughs> It'd be a bit like this. Great, great. And, uh... okay. Nick, is a shoe the devil? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, what uh, what I have seen uh, lately is that uh, Kimbanda has uh, kind of become a bit uh, fashion in Brazil. So it's a lot of Kimbanda growing up and uh, here and there. And, uh, so on uh, one hand, I'm seeing that uh, some, some kind of mainstream Kimbanda has been uh, mm -hmm. taking shape, uh, mm -hmm. especially the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and then we had this counter... Uh, movement that is uh, you know, evangelic uh, Christians, is born again Christians, that is also growing, that uh, is of course uh, not very happy about this diabolic imagery that uh, that is invested there. So 
I say that yeah, it's kind of on one hand, it's a bit in, in the vogue in Brazil lately, and on the other hand, it's giving a fuel to the fire for the Pentecostals to, to fight the devil. Uh, but for me, it's a uh, this diabolic imagery of Eshu and Pumajira is very important because it's a, it's a challenge for us in terms of uh, who and what we accept in life. And uh, of the many legacies or uh, influences that created this uh, diabolic uh, imagery of Eshu, uh, I have to remember in Angola and Congo, uh, with the Capuchins and the Jesuit missionaries and uh, all the confusion and uh, stuff down there, uh, so the mission came, and uh, so you have to be baptized to the one true God. And uh, the, the, the Congo and Angola people were seeing these people as were not good at all, right? So, but they're speaking about this uh, Satan figure, this devil figure, that they are really afraid of. It. So if these are not good people, maybe that guy that they speak bad about is the good guy. Yeah? And uh, they are afraid of him. So maybe he can be over, uh, over support, over guardian. So... Uh, is this factor as well in the history of uh, Kimbanda. But uh, uh, more than anything, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge to over uh, legal status, over uh, reformed opinions, over prejudice, uh, about things. It's kind of, so you see how I am eh? here with cloven hoof and horns and uh, heart of fire. You trust me? Yeah, okay. Let's take this uh, adventure called life together. So I think uh, it's, it's very, I, I like this diabolic uh, imagery because of this. And also it's, uh, uh, they also speak about uh, how much we humans uh, deny of life, how we uh, tend to, uh, you uh, see, avoid living life, really, is kind of always this, uh, ah, this is the good thing, this is the bad thing. It's, uh, they're also challenging this, uh, uh, or perception of uh, that there is just two sides to everything, and uh, they become their uh, shade of gray with horns. Yeah, I agree with you. Actually, I, I understand we have two, uh, two, uh, two reasons for this diabolic link between Kimbanda spirits and, and the, devil, the devil itself. And the first thing I guess it's very important to notice is that Kimbanda is a black people tradition. Even though Nick and I, we are, Nick is absolutely Caucasian, white Caucasian and I'm a white Latino, <laughs> let's call it like that. Uh, we are both white men. And I don't, know, I don't want to take this place, uh, this, this place of, uh, of saying, but Kimbanda is a black people tradition. And it's important to say that in my Kimbanda, in my tradition, Kimbanda was founded by a black poor woman. And in Nick's tradition, Kimbanda was founded by a black poor gay man. And this is something very important to, to be noticed. And so the first glance of this diabolic version of Kimbanda is called racism. And mm. that's it. We have a, a white middle-class uh, Christian society that is uh, challenged, challenged by a uh, black, white, uh, black, gay, poor man and a black uneducated woman saying, no, we have our own magic, we have our own traditions, we have our own cults, and you don't have anything to do with, oh, you got to be a good person and leave, uh, and not leave avoiding sin so you can save yourself. Our tradition, our cult, our belief says you can leave, you must leave all that life can give you, and that's good and bad amongst. And this is something that uh, I, I actually faced when editing the English edition of uh, tradi traditional Brazilian black magic book, because the editors, uh, the first title would be traditional Afro-Brazilian black magic book. And I said, mm. no, you take the Afro-Brazilian, it's black, uh, black magic, Brazilian black magic. 
it's the black magic in the in the magic sense of the of, of the expression because yeah we do uh, harmful spells uh Eshu is not 100 good nor 100 evil he is good and evil he is light and darkness in itself and that's what black magic is all about in the in the magical sense of the, of the expression but it's also a black magic a, a magic created and originated from black people so first thing is that everything that is not Uh, white middle class Christian is considered to be the devil, and that's the first point. It's racism, mm -hmm. pure, pure and simple racism. The second point, and then I see the the, the the symbolic and the spiritual devil, is that we don't deny our darkness. As Kim Bandero, we actually we embrace our darkness, and that's the the biggest goal, I guess for Akim Bandeiro, to be able to embrace its own darkness and to grow from that, from there, and not to be swallowed by, by this darkness. And in this, in this sense, I, and, and I, I contradict myself from a few years ago where I, uh, I discussed a lot and I, I well, I, I had a lot of, a lot of uh, non-friends from Orchid communities and Facebook communities because I struggle to say, no, Eshu is not the devil. And nowadays I say, yes, Eshu is the devil. <laughs> But which devil we're talking about? Are we I talking about we, the, you know? Uh, it's uh, kind of, Eshu is the devil. It's you that don't understand the devil. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's, this is the <laughs> thing, this is the thing. Eshu, yeah, Eshu is the devil. You don't know what the devil is. Yeah. And that's the... And I would say, Nick, that's, that's not only the biggest goal a Kim Bandeiro must search for and must look for in this symbiotic relationship we, we create with the spirits, but also I think this would be the, the answer for, for people living abroad and people watching us and that they are, that are, that are probably asking themselves, but why should I follow Kimbanda? Why should I look for Kimbanda? Why should I get initiated in Kimbanda? Mm -hmm. And I think at this point of life, I think I would answer to really know the devil and your devils. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. It's, uh, I think uh, for me, this is the kind of the essence of a full life. It's, uh, you have to embrace uh, who you are, good and bad, warts and all. And, exactly. uh, Because that's what the issue is teaching us to do, you know. It's, uh, it's uh, all these kind of things with, okay, if you deny your shadow, what happens? Well, you create monsters. And yeah. bad things happen. It's, uh, no, it's true, Diego. I completely agree. Maybe by, by facing your own devils, you will become a uh, self. Uh, you will self divinize yourself, you know. You will become mm. a, a human deity maybe. maybe i guess that's the thing <laughs> <laughs>
herbal, uh, herbal magic recites at home and how to use the power and secrets and magic of leaves in your daily life. That's the sick red leaves there by Llewellyn. You can find this in Watkins, uh, Watkins books, which is Afro-Brazilian numerology, a much different subject uh, from both of, from the three books that is actually a self-knowledge and uh, self-growing book based on a African uh, Afro-Brazilian tradition of an uh, Afro Afro-Brazilian numerology tradition where we understand, we identify which uh, energies rule and guide your birth, uh, say, rule and guide you since birth, and how you can, in a, in a, in a way, how you can face your own demons, as we're talking about Kimbanda, but that's two different subjects. Yeah, uh, Diego. So yeah. since I had the honor of reading uh, that book, I think uh, it's a, uh, it's a amazing this approach you have in this book with uh, how you presented a, a manual for self-knowledge exactly. through spirits you, and man. oracles so it's uh, really recommended thank you thank you a lot Nick. it's an honor to me to to hear you <laughs> saying that because uh well you're a if a priest you're a traditional orisha uh religion african religion priest and hear this from you is a is a blessing actually so uh, no, it's, uh, I'm, I'm really appreciated the, appreciate this uh, approach you the, uh, where you kind of, uh, it's so obvious that you want to help people through this. Uh, exactly. This book, you know? and, it's kind and of, it's... Uh... <laughs> that's the thing. Afro-Brazilian numerology is not a, uh, a traditional book. It's not a book to teach people what is uh, Orisha's religion or what is or Orisha's practice. Actually, it's a, we take a bit of Afro-Brazilian Afro traditions. We take a bit of Candomblé traditions and transform this in a self-empowerment and self-knowledge tool, tool that people can use to know themselves more and to transform their, their lives. That's the whole idea of the book. So you get to, of course, you will learn in the book how to identify these energies, how to do the math for the numerology, but more than that, how to get these uh, counsels and interpretations of the Odus and to really transform your life. And I guess that's the, the uh, there is one thing, uh, Carl, that I, that I haven't told you, but we have a new release coming next March, but I guess people can already pre-order it. It's a Orisha's card deck, an Oracle card deck, based on the Orishas and the Odus and in African uh, Afro-Brazilian numerology. It's going to be published by Rockpool, uh, Rockpool Australia and soon to be in uh, all England. So people can pre-order this in Watkins too. The Orishas Magic Oracle. Thank you, Nick. A pleasure, really. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Good evening.